Welcome to Titan's Grave, or more accurately, the set for Titan's Grave. Titan's Grave doesn't exist. It's a place that I made up. But today, I'm going to introduce you to the characters in the world I made up, so you have a stronger foundation to build our show in your mind. We have got amazing artists from around the world creating tons of art to help you visualize the world of Volcana, but the bulk of the images, actually the, the bulk of the world really, is going to exist in your mind because this is one of the things I really love about role-playing games. When we play a game, everyone involved has a different version of the world in their imagination. That includes us on the set and you at home or wherever you're watching this because it's the internet and the internet is everywhere. Before we delve into the mythology, characters, and history of Volcana, I need to go over some of the basics of playing a role-playing game for those of you who might not know much about RPGs and the age system that Titan's Grave is based on. In fact, I'm willing to bet that most of you aren't that familiar with Fantasy Age because, as it turns out, The Ashes of Volcana is the very first adventure campaign that was created for it, which, I'm not gonna lie, I think is kinda cool. So let's talk about the fundamental basics of role-playing games, which I'll call RPGs, because quite honestly, I'm very busy and don't have time to say the whole thing every time. The Game Master is the only person at the table who knows all the secret things the players will encounter during the game, and he or she will help the players discover those secrets through a series of encounters with monsters, traps, allies, and enemies. You could think of the Game Master as a blend of host, referee for the rules, and lead storyteller. Now, this part is really important. Unlike a story that you would experience in a movie, a book, on TV, or even a tale told around a campfire, the player characters in a role-playing game are fundamental and integral to the story, and they can and will change it while they play. A really good GM will always react to the choices the players make and let the players guide the story from place to place. This means that the same game could be run multiple times by the same people, but the story is always gonna be different depending on the choices they make. For those of you out there who play video games, it's like choosing to go Paragon or Renegade in Mass Effect, but on a much larger scale, because the Game Master can do anything in her imagination, and a video game is limited by its programming. Let's talk a little bit about characters and how those characters are created. When I run a game, I always let my players decide what kind of character they want to play. Maybe they want to play a rogue who carries a dark, sinister secret. Maybe they want to be a good wizard who will only use their magical power to help people who are in need. You want to be an explorer who never wants anyone to find out about your disgraceful past in a far-off land that, oh no, we have to go adventure in? They can be anyone they want to be. And as a game master, I am going to help them bring that character to life and facilitate the telling of that character's story. So to keep track of the important things about the characters, things like how strong or smart they are, what kind of armor they're wearing, and how wounded they are, each player is going to fill out one of these character sheets. These different statistics let the players and the game master know how good or bad that character is at things like throwing a punch, deciphering a scroll, or not falling into a hidden acid pit that has absolutely no business being in the foyer of a mansion, Chris Perkins. That doesn't even make any sense. It should never have been there, you murderer. Whenever a player wants to do something that has a chance of failure, I'm going to tell them to make a test and use one of those statistics. The players roll some dice, add them up, apply any modifiers that they get from their relevant stat, and I tell them if they succeeded or failed. For example, in our game, Allison Hayslip's character, Kiliel, is really agile, so she has a very high dexterity score. Yuri Lowenthal's character isn't nearly as agile as she is. He's a wizard, agility isn't that important to him, so his score is much lower. When they both have to dodge a thrown dagger, 
Allison has a better chance of avoiding it because her dexterity modifier is a four, while Yuri's dexterity modifier is a zero. In this example, when I, as the game master, throw that dagger, I'll tell them to make a dexterity test, right? Because that's the relevant stat to getting out of the way. On my side of the test, I decide how difficult it's going to be to not get hit, and I give that test a target number to reflect that difficulty. A uh, one is really simple, and 20 and above is really hard all the way up to impossible. On their side of the test, they roll their dice, apply their modifier, and then they let me know the result. So if Allison rolled three, five, six, that would equal 14. She adds her modifier of four and gets 18. So Allison rolled an 18 on her dexterity test. Yuri rolls five, two, two for nine. Oh, Yuri. And adds his modifier of zero, and he gets nine on his dexterity test. I decided that the dagger was coming at them out of the dark, so it was pretty difficult to dodge to begin with, and the target number they needed to meet or exceed was 17. Allison rolls out of the way, and now Yuri has a splitting headache because he has a dagger in his head. Get it, right? It's very, shut up, it's funny. The age system that we are using is very similar to the one used in the Dragon Age RPG we played in season one of Tabletop. You might remember that it has a unique mechanic called stunting, which lets the player do extra actions if they roll doubles on two of their three dice. The number on the action die when they do that, that's one of the three that's a different color, determines the number of stunt points that they get to use. We also had this idea during production that we could do a new mechanic that is totally unique to Titan's Grave. If a player rolls three sixes, not only will the player get to do the most awesome stunt imaginable, but the GM, me, will cement the player's action in history by making it something legendary that people speak of for years and maybe decades after it happens. You could do that in your game too, if you wanted or not. I'm not the boss of you, except you. I am the boss of you. I am really excited to introduce you to the world of Volcana. Volcana is a science fantasy setting. It is inspired by classics like the cartoon Thundar the Barbarian and the heavy metal movie. I'm going to give you a brief but broad history of Volcana, focused on the three major events that shaped the world as it exists today. For centuries, the Saurian Empire, through their mastery of technology, ruthless subjugation of the elves and humans, and enslavement of the orcs claimed absolute dominion over Volcana until one day the sky itself fell down upon them, destroying their cities, killing millions, and plunging the world into a long darkness. Every culture has a different explanation for the day the sky fell down, but it would be the Saurian belief that ended up having the greatest impact on Volcana. A charismatic Saurian called the Prophet Dewan preached that the gods were right to punish not just the Saurians, but all the people on Volcana. She preached that the melding of science and magic was an abomination, a blasphemy. She declared that Providence commanded all true users of magic to rise up and purify their societies. Only when magic and science were permanently separated would the gods be mollified. The prophet and her followers were determined to spread her message across all of Volcana, first with open arms and then with closed fists. Few took the prophet seriously at first, but that changed quickly when the first villages were consumed by flames. Almost immediately, uprisings began throughout every major kingdom. All over the continent, the cult of the prophet took root, and soon the nations were tearing themselves apart. The prophet's armies grew, and her enemies soon realized that they had to unite to end the threat. Thus began the Chaos Wars. 
It took decades and countless desperate battles and the blood of millions. But the prophet was defeated and her armies dismantled and scattered. By the end of the chaos wars, the world had been reshaped. Many of the cities that had been rebuilt after the apocalypse were again destroyed. Entire populations were dispersed while small pockets of cultists remain. The prophet Dewan is widely despised as a force of evil who brought suffering and destruction to all she touched. And the great heroes who defeated her are revered. Today, as the ashes of Vulcana begins, an ancient evil not seen since the time of the prophet is rising. And our four heroes may be the only ones who can stop it. So, let's meet them. I would like you to sort of introduce your characters to the audience. So, um, go ahead and so introduce, introduce. Just go for it? Yeah, introduce your characters. To introduce um, them to us. Okay, yeah. so my character, her name is Lemley. She is 17 years old, she's a human. She was orphaned at a very young age and found by her new parents, which were Saurian parents. Around the age of 14, she was messing with some old tech that she found and hadn't told anybody about it, and it exploded on her and um, blew out her arm and her leg and uh, ended up killing her parents in the process. It was very sad. Um, so now she has a cyborg arm and a cyborg leg, and um, she's been wandering around kind of as an orphan since then. Right, not just an orphan, but an orphan who killed her own parents. Who killed yeah. her own parents. Yeah, that's kind of By be accident. Fun. Yeah, but you know, you're never gonna forgive yourself. You're not really. Thing. No, which is funny, because um, when I happened upon you, um, I kind of, for the first time, felt like I belonged somewhere. It kind of makes sense. I hadn't been introduced to this character, but knowing my character, that does make sense. Let's jump down and meet your character, Hank. Oh, okay, jumping across. My character is named Ankia. She is a young Saurian female. She uh, was raised by a single father, and he was a street performer, and he would go out with his, with like little sort of like this high mechanical puppets, and they would perform sort of puppet acts. And their show was crashed into by a vehicle. Uh, it destroyed most of the robots, and over the course of several months, he uh, never recovered and died of those wounds. And Happy she, family was, life. she was able to, though, cobble together one of the robots from all of the different spare parts of the ones that have been destroyed. That accompanies her. Does your robot have a name? Jeremy. <laughs> oh, I like it. Jeremy's That's fantastic. adorable. Did they, did they ever find the person who... Uh... No, uh, actually her short-term and long-term goals uh, are also written down. Short-term survival, long-term vengeance. <laughs> So, always yeah. a good, always yeah, a good totally long term sense. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Lemley. Yes. What are the names of your weapons? Oh, well, I have uh, an awesome sword that comes out of my arm. Yes. <laughs> and that's name is Doctor Lobotomy. <laughs> does, it, does it actually say Doctor Lobotomy on the blade? Of course it's, 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 yeah, it's it does. Laser engraved. It's laser engraved. <laughs> that's like great. I love that. It has inscribed, and if I've... you can read this, <laughs> yeah. if you read this, you're probably dead. You're lobotomized. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, and uh, which of you did they, did they come across first? Yes, Yuri. You. Yes. Tell yes. Me right. If you would please. <laughs> it was years meet, ago that we. Uh, let's yeah. meet your character. Uh, my character is Slethk Dormor. He's a half orc, half Saurian. Um, I was. Can you tell us more about the illicit, the actual <laughs> romance. Not the romance, just the sex itself. Just the sex itself. How did it biologically work? <laughs> okay. Right. Uh, so let's fan let's fiction get, writers, if you could get to work and just let Hank know, <laughs> Thank you. that would be really <laughs> useful <Email>. for him. <laughs> Hank at hankring.com. The subject should just be something like, "What's wrong with you, bro?" <laughs> <laughs> uh, please continue. Uh, one day, the, the kids from the, the Saurian side who detested me uh, locked me away in uh, a religious chapel in the house. And I, I had been left there for a long time. They assumed I would be found, and I wasn't for, for days. Um, and in trying to survive, I uncovered a, um, a hidden uh, room in, in the chapel and found old religious texts. And I, I learned magic and when I was finally found everybody looked at me different every you know they were they were a little scared of me 
Um, but I didn't see anything, I didn't see a huge change. Um, but the short term goal is my brother, my orc brother, um, we never got along very well and I want, I want to find him and uh, mend things. And you found your, your way to uh, Ankia and Lemley uh, because they were performing and uh, Lemley thought you were cute. You were pretty dreamy. Um, and, uh, <laughs> for, yeah. for a half orc, right. and, and a half sorry. Right, and, and then uh, hung around to uh, particip begin participating in the shows. Um, and in the course of your travels, you one day uh, came across. Me. <laughs> <laughs> Forever changed. I am Kiliel. I am half elf, half dwarf. And my parents, my biological elf mother, and my not biological elf dad uh, own a, a a tiny little shop together where they sell um, ancient relics and rare rare artifacts and things like that. And when I was young, my father would go off on these journeys to find these things to sell. And then one day he went off on a journey and just did not come back. And then my mother fell in love with a very attractive dwarf, um, and thus. I was created, but then surprise, my elf dad came back, having been what? lost, what? What? found out that his wife was pregnant with someone else's child. But don't dwarves and elves, but don't yeah. dwarves and elves get along usually? Never. <laughs> <laughs> Never. So um, See, it's funny because they that they usually <laughs> don't. <laughs> and you guys wander into my parents' shop because you have I a have locket. a locket, which was the only thing I had left from my original parents. The only thing on me when my Saurian parents found me was this locket. So one of my goals is to find out more about my family through this. So I like to go to places that deal in antiques and relics and see what they know about it. So I found her. Right. And so my family is at the point right now where my dad is too old to get out very frequently to find mm -hmm. um, other treasures. Also, maybe he's thinking he shouldn't leave so often. Right. <laughs> very true, very true. Um, and I've never seen the world, so I decide to join up with the band so I can go out and find more antiques and relics to bring back to my family's shop. But also, my long-term goal and my secret mission is to find my dwarf dad, because I've never met him before. It must be nice to have a dad to try and find. I know. Oh. I know. I, how am I the only one who ends Everybody up with like, a sad. somewhat healthy Everybody family. roll for sadness. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I rolled a two. <laughs> one of the things that I really like to do, and something that I actually suggest all game masters do, is let the players have secrets that their characters are keeping from each other. It changes the way that they think, it brings depth and complexity to their characters, and it lets me serve the story in ways that will be appealing to them. On our first day of production, I gathered the actors and I asked them, do you guys have any secrets that you know about yourselves? What about secrets that you know about the other players? They all had something to tell me, and this is what happened. No. What do you know? I know that that locket that Lemley brought in with the three on it, mm -hmm. my parents wouldn't tell her what it said. They said that they didn't know, mm -hmm. but I knew. And it actually means the people who have those lockets are descended from a very terrible uh, branch of humans. So what nobody else knows is actually how much of my body was blasted away. In pretty much half of my body was gone. Oh, so wow. a lot of organs have been meshed together. and and. Anki is the only one that really has seen any of that uh -huh. and really has worked on that with yeah. me. Uh -huh. For some reason, I connect that with what I actually committed, what I actually did to my parents. Mm -hmm. These, I feel like I can bring them out and I can make it right and I can fight with this, but mm -hmm. this, I can't do anything with this. And it, I just have to keep that, what I did to yeah. myself. Yeah, okay. I also what? didn't, I, I never felt like I was going to have a friend again. Uh-huh. So like just the act that she would, share something yeah. with me. I yeah. felt like suddenly. Yeah. That that event that happened in the in the church when he was uh -huh. very young uh -huh. that tied him, you know, sort of to his God. Yeah. Um, I think he talks to that that entity from uh -huh. time and believes that he is in contact, but understands that that's not socially acceptable uh, for, for regular sane people. Mm -hmm. 
So sometimes uh, I'm actually talking to that. Awesome. You're awesome. I know. I mean, you I mean you're awesome. <laughs> yeah. The stage is set. I cannot wait for you to experience the adventure ahead. And unlike Tabletop, which has new episodes every other week, new episodes of Titan's Grave release every week, starting today. We've worked so hard on this, you guys. I sincerely hope that you love it, and I hope that it inspires you to play more games.